Now in the last part of this question, what we've got to do then is find R and P. And we're given, remember, that mu equals 0 0.5 and tan alpha equals 3 quarters. So, how do we do this? Well, in fact, there's two ways that we could do this problem. And what I'm going to show you is what I would think is going to be one of the most common ways of doing it, but there is just a one-off routine that we could use, which I'll show you in the next video, which is really a better, quicker method. But for the moment, what we'll do is we'll do a standard approach to this problem. When you've got um, particles on planes, I'd like to think that what you do is draw a kind of cross section, something like this. All right, okay. Now we need to fill in some angles, and we've got the angle of the plane is alpha. And always when you've got planes, this angle in here, mark it in, is going to be alpha. And in this particular question, we need to look at this section in here, and you'll see that the angle alpha appears as this angle here. Why? Because we've got what we call corresponding angles. You've got two parallel lines here, and then this angle will be the same as that one. Okay, so we've got our angles marked in, and we know the particles in equilibrium. So to start off, what we've got to do is resolve perpendicular to the plane. And if we resolve perpendicular to the plane, let's take away from the plane as being the positive di direction. So if we resolve perpendicular to the plane, we've got all of R acts in that direction, so we can put R. And then if we look at mu R, mu R is perpendicular to this direction, so it has no effect. Now we come round to the P. Now, P is not on this dotted line here, okay? So we've got to think of P as split into two components, one in that direction and one in that direction. Just let me remind you about components very quickly. If you've got a force, let's say we've got a force here, let's say it's X, we can split this into two components at right angles to one another. Let's say we split it into a force in that direction and a force in this direction. That's meant to be a right angle in there. Now, if you've got a right angle and one of these angles just happens to be given to you, let's say it's this one, theta, then the component that contains the angle theta is always given by x times the cosine of the angle, x cos theta, and the one that doesn't contain the angle is always the sine of theta. So we have the two components like this. And this is something that you should basically know, that when you've got a right angle in here. Right? So when it comes on to splitting P into two components, one that way, one that way, we're interested in this component down here, which acts along this line. And because it doesn't contain the angle alpha, it's going to be P sine alpha. Uh, so we have minus, because it op acts in the opposite sense to this, minus p sine alpha. Now we come on to the weight here, 1.1 g newtons. We can split this into two components, one in that direction, one in that direction. The one in this direction has no effect because it's perpendicular to this direction. We're only interested in this component of the 1.1 g. Now it contains the angle, so it's going to be 1.1 g cos alpha. And it'll be minus, because it's in the opposite sense to this, minus 1.1 g cos alpha. We've done all the forces now, and this gives the resultant force acting on the package in a perpendicular direction to the plane. And it's not moving perpendicular to the plane, so therefore the resultant force is zero. Now, we need to clean this up. We've got sine alphas, we've got cos alphas. So we need to find out what sine alpha and cos alpha is. And that's where this comes into play. Tan alpha equals 3 quarters. What we do is think of a right angle triangle 
where you've got the angle alpha here and we should know that tan of an angle always compares the opposite side to the adjacent. So the two sides, the opposite and the adjacent, are in the ratio 3 to 4. So that means that for every three units you rise here, this would go four units across here. And we can get the hypotenuse of this triangle by using Pythagoras' theorem. It would be the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared. In other words, the square root of 25, which is 5. But you should know this triangle. It's a common one. We often call it the 3, 4, 5 triangle. OK, so what does that mean? Well, when it comes to tidying this equation up, we've got r minus p times the sine of alpha. And the sine of alpha is always the opposite side over the hypotenuse. So that would be 3 fifths, or as a decimal, 0 0.6. And notice we didn't have to find alpha. And when it comes to this term, we've got minus 1.1g times the cosine of alpha. And cosine of an angle is adjacent over hypotenuse, so it would be 4 fifths. 4 fifths as a decimal is 0 0.8. So could put that in as 0 0.8 and that equals 0. So all we need to do now is say make r the subject. We could make p the subject, but I'm going to make r the subject because it looks simpler to work with. So if I make r the subject, I've got to add 0 0.6p to both sides. So we've got that. And if I work out this term, on a calculator, you find that you get 8.624. So if I add that to both sides, we get plus 8.624. That's taking g to be 9.8. OK, we've got two unknowns here, so I can't solve this at the moment. So we'll just put this down as equation 1. What I've now got to do is get another equation and I can do that by resolving either up the plane or down the plane. I'm going to choose up the plane as being positive so we'll just do that. So what do we have this time? Well we've got mu r which all of that force acts up the plane so I'm going to write mu which is 0 0.5 0 0.5 times r and I know that r is this particular value here. In fact, what I'll do is I'll leave that for the moment, just in case you're looking back over this. But I'm going to want to substitute this into here in a moment. And then we've got the p. Now, p is not on this dotted line here, through here. So we've got to split this into two components, one in that direction, one in that direction. We're not interested in this component because it's at right angles to this direction. We only want this component of P. So it contains the angle, so it's going to be P cos alpha. And it's acting in the plus sense, so that's P cos alpha. Then we come around to the weight here. Now the weight doesn't act on this dotted line, so we've got to think of splitting this into two components. So we've got one that way, and one downwards. We're not interested in the one into the plane, we're only interested in this component down the plane. And because that doesn't contain the angle alpha, it's going to be 1.1g sine alpha, and it's acting in the negative sense, so it's minus 1.1g sine alpha. And the particle's in equilibrium, so therefore it's not moving, there's no resultant force, so it equals zero. So what I'm going to do now is simply substitute number 1 for r into this equation. And I'm also going to fill this out with what cos alpha and sine alpha are. So if we do that, we'd better just say that we're subbing 1 into this equation. So sub 1 into, should we call it 2? OK, into 2. And what have we got? We therefore have 0 0.5 times r, so we've got 0.6p plus 8.624. And then we've got p cos alpha, so as before, cos alpha was 4 fifths, or 0 0.8, so we've got 0 0.8p. 
and then minus, we've got 1.1g times sine of alpha. Sine of alpha was 3 fifths or 0 0.6. And if you do that sum, what you actually get is 6.468. Okay, I'll leave it up to you just to check that out on your calculator. And that equals 0. Now, if we expand this and rearrange it for p, okay, what you should find that you get is that if you do 0 0.5 times 0 0.6p and add it to 0.8p, you'll end up with 1.1p. Okay, so I'll leave that up to you just to double check that. And if you do 0 0.5 times 8.624 and then take that term and the 6.468 to the other side of the equation, you should find that you get 2. 1.56. Okay? And then if I divide both sides by 1.1, you end up with p equaling 1.96 exactly. So it's 1.96 newtons. Alright? So I've skipped a few stages there purely because I'm running out of room. Alright? And uh, I'm sure you should be okay with that. What we need to do now now that we've got p is just substitute this back into say equation 1 because that's the simplest one and we can get r so if I just say then we'll just say substitute sub p equals 1.96 into equation 1 then what we have is r equals 0 0.6 multiplied by 1.96 for the p and then plus 8.624. And what we've got then is that if you work that one out, you get 9.8 newtons. Okay? Well, in this question, they wanted to know what R was first of all. So R is obviously 9.8 newtons. And then in part two of the question, they wanted to know what P was. So therefore, P equals 1.96 newtons. Okay, so that brings us to uh, the end of uh, this particular question, but there is, as I say, a slightly quicker way that we could have done this question. It's, it tends to be a one-off, though, for this kind of problem, and you'll see that in my other video.